I'll tell you, there is a lot to talk about. Uh, a lot of movies came out this week. I still haven't seen Predators, for example, and this whole wrestling thing, only done in one episode, but it's already seeming to be a bigger challenge than even I had anticipated. So I've got like all these pay-per-views to talk about, but first thing I'd like to talk about is Inception, which is the hotly anticipated movie, uh, Christopher Nolan's next movie after The Dark Knight, which has um, been very mysterious. I was actually impressed, very impressed, with how under wraps they kept the, the whole plot of the story. Usually you get these previews that give away pretty much everything tell you everything that's going on. In this one, all you really knew that it was like Leonardo's some kind of, uh, pardon me, like a dream architect or something. Like, he can go into your dreams. But that's pretty much all you ever figured out. Now, I do think the uh, the preview did kind of spoil the the set-piece action sequence, but that was probably a necessary evil. So, um, difficult movie to review. And actually, I, I've kind of reversed on it two or three times just thinking about whether or not I really liked the movie. A very interesting film, and uh, I saw it with Scarlett, and um, she didn't like it. And uh, I walked out of the theater feeling very good about it. And so we had this, like, honestly, this great conversation, uh, just, just discussing what, what worked and what didn't work, what she liked, what I liked. And, you know, it, it was kind of funny where she, I, I kind of considered myself kind of this film snob, and she was bringing up, pretty great points, like stuff I hadn't even really thought about. And um, she, she was entirely right. And so I started thinking, like, wow, maybe this movie isn't as good as I thought. Because, you, know, you know, sometimes these movies, you see these films and they're like really great spectacles at first, but when you stop to think about them, you're like, well, maybe that really didn't make a whole lot of sense. And so, you know, the, the, the general premise of this film is that Leonardo DiCaprio is kind of this, uh, I, I hate to say thief, but he's, he works outside the law using this technology that allows him to invade people's dreams, and he uses this to commit, essentially, industrial espionage, stealing secrets from, from people and selling them off to other people who hire him. And so it's a little more complicated than that, but he's got kind of this Mission Impossible team that they have all their specialized roles, and it was really interesting. And I, I, I thought it was... Seriously, the originality of this script is something that I think speaks a lot for my enjoyment of the film. And, you know, I, I am very much this guy who, whenever he sees a movie, immediately draws references to what it seems like, what it, I conceive it to be ripping off. I have this very been-there-done-that jaded sensibility. So, um, when it comes to Inception, I was I was pretty blown away by, by just the sheer uniqueness of the concept. I, I simply couldn't believe that that somebody kind of came up with this shit. Like, um... The, the 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 complexities, the technology. This was, I really consider this to be kind of a pure original screenplay. That this it was really a first. So I I very much treasure a filmmaker who can bring a film to me that is honestly I can walk away from that saying I've never seen something like that before. Uh, Takashi Miike is one of those guys who whether I like his films or I don't like his films, and believe it or not. It's about half and half in films of his that I really like and really dislike, but I actually kind of treasure every one of his films because I can safely say, no matter what, I've pretty much never seen what he's putting on screen before, and I can kind of say that with Inception. So, for that alone, I think it's worth seeing because, you know, just for the sheer awesomeness of the conversation that I had with Scarlett on the ride home, you know, and, and back here, just talking about it, that was, you know, seriously, I have seen, I have paid much more for much worse movies and gotten much less entertainment out of it, and had less interesting conversations you know, than that. So the conversation alone, priceless, okay? But when I'll, I'll discuss what she, what she didn't like and what I liked in a minute, but I, I kind of started realizing, um, and I, I had read actually very negative reviews leading up to this one, uh, and I, I find, kind of found it hard to believe. And now I believe it. And... Um, I think the parallels to The Matrix are unavoidable, not because it necessarily rips off The Matrix, although there are similarities, at least in the sense that you've got these characters who are living in a dream world and they cannot tell dream from reality. I mean, I think that's, when you've got that premise, the comparisons are unavoidable, but you've also got this concept that a lot of people saw Matrix, well, not, not a lot of people, Matrix was a major leap forward in filmmaking, where... It, it really upped the level of technology. It kind of gave us these iconic scenes that raised the bar for special effects. And 
it was it was kind of a landmark film. It really defined almost that decade of filmmaking. And it wasn't a great film. It was a very good film. It was a very entertaining film. It was a very original screen it was an original screenplay that made us think about uh, science fiction in a new way. And like that alone, when you revolutionize science fiction in that fashion and you bring that type of story out to the forefront and you've kind of illuminated the world of you know creative filmmaking, that is an amazing feat. So I, I the the parallels are astonishing to The Matrix because I really think this will stand as a landmark film. Not only in special effects, but a landmark film in the in the history of science fiction. But at the same time, Matrix, the, as the years have gone by, we've kind of looked back at the Matrix and and started to realize, like you know, and maybe not even that far along. We, we you know, when you got back home, you started thinking about the Matrix, going, "Wow, that really didn't make a whole lot of sense." But in the theater, that was really awesome stuff to watch. So, and I'm making it sound like Christopher Nolan kind of pulled a Michael Bay and like wowed us with explosions and, and splashy special effects and maybe he did but that wasn't his intention and so I, I, I think right off the bat you have to realize that's where you're kind of coming from like if you come back home and you start to ask questions like you know we really don't know that much about this dream technology we just kind of take it as red when these guys whip out this this suitcase and they start hooking up IVs like we can go inside your dreams and we can start fucking around and like Ellen Page, she can just rewrite the rules of reality in your in your brain. She can like create cities on a will. And Scarlett, she comes back home and she's like, you know, they didn't explain anything. And I'm like, you know, they didn't, did they? Because they just kind of sit it. They they sit in a chair and like I'm damn Skippy that it's not as simple as sitting in a chair and like, and then like boom, we're in a collective dream. Sometimes with stuff like that, you really got to explain this shit. You know, like you can't just say like, oh, we have this, you stick a needle in collective dreaming. And it's not a new concept, this collective dreaming. I've actually read a bunch of comics by Warren Ellis that explore the concept of uh, collective dreaming and um, collective unconscious and stuff like that. It's not a new concept, but I think this is really the first time it's ever been brought on film, at least that I've seen. So there's a lot of questions like, who designed this? Why did they design it? They kind of throw this excuse out there like it was used as a training technique for soldiers to resist pain um, and to engage in like full contact sparring and actually like kill each other without actually killing each other. And I'm like, okay, but how did this technology get out? Who trained these guys? Why would they train anybody if the only apparent use for this is military and illegal? So, and I actually, you know, I, I kind of counter that by saying, at well, at the same time, they would have had to they would have had to spend like 45 minutes just outlying explanations for everything like do you, do we really need that at much exposition did we really need explanations for that maybe i don't know but i do know that it would have definitely bogged the film down a lot more than it was as it stands there was a lot of exposition in this film just as ellen page is the uh is the uh, protagonist, really the everyman character, the audience proxy, where Leonardo DiCaprio is explaining all this stuff to her, like how dreams work, how the projections of the subconscious work, and how they turn against people. And, you know, it. I actually said that, you know, I, I think it's actually testament to how cool the concept is that you have all these questions. You're like, I want to know more about this. Like, like this, almost like this story couldn't go on long enough. Like, if, you, if this were, like, you almost want to see, like, a series of books based on this stuff. And I, I kind of hope that there will be books because exploring more of this world is awesome. Like, you want to know more about this stuff. You want to know about this technology because it seems really, really interesting. You know, um, you want to see more of these cases that these guys have been on that they refer to, these techniques that they pull off, how they got started, where they're going from here, you know, the, the nature of these crimes that they're pulling off. Really fascinating stuff. But at the same time, it does leave a lot in the air. And um, when she started explaining this to me, I was like, wow, yeah, you're right. They started really leaving this stuff up in the air. And it it was kind of a frustrating watch because I can definitely see, unless you are 100% invested in this movie, following it from beginning to end, you're not going to follow this movie because there's so much going on. And in fact, the very nature of this movie is layers. And so... Not only we're we talking about dreams within dreams, we're talking about dreams within dreams within dreams. And in fact, at some point, I'm going to get into spoiler territory here, so I'm just going to tell you 
you better be careful because I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna spoil most of it for you. But we get with like you get like four dreams deep, like dream within dream within dream within dream, like and we start getting like so low here. Um, it's frustrating, and I I was really paying attention to it, and I've seen Nolan's other movies. I've seen Memento, and I love Memento. Um, and you know, we we got so deep in this. Even I didn't know, like when they got four dreams deep, like who whose dream we were in, because you're actually within somebody's dream, within somebody else's dream. Like you're in Leo's dream, but then we go into Fisher's dream, and so you've got these stacked dreams, and it. Like, when you're going with the flow of it, when you're in the moment in the movie, you're kind of rolling with it. But at the same time, you're like, I don't know what the fuck is going on. Like, you got... They, they, they make it very clear. Like, when you're in a dream state, time moves, like, 20, 20 times slower. So, but when you're in a dream within a dream, it kind of factors exponentially. Like, it's almost like a... Ge- like, I don't know if it's exponential or geometric, but you got, like, this... It's 20 times slower in the first dream, but it's 20 times slower in that in the dream within a dream. So, you get to this point when you're solo in dreams... Like, a second in the real world is, like, 50 years. So, if you get stuck within your four layers of dreaming, you know, like, an hour of sleep, you will have mentally aged, like, 3,000 years plus. So, like, you'll you'll come out this complete, just, mental mush. And so, in in the science fiction... Like, when you're in the flow of it, you're like, it makes sense. Like, I'm following this, I'm kind of digging this, but when I come back, I started to think. And... It started to fall apart a little bit. I was like, wow. And here's where I I, I I rolled with it at first. When I got home, I started to think, you know, I have never experienced a dream within a dream in my life. Or if I have, I don't remember it. And the movie relies very heavily on you buying into the fact that one can have dreams within dreams. Like waking up from one dream and then realizing I'm in a dream all of the... Like, and I, I, I started to, to it, it kind of fell apart for me when I, when I started to realize that. I was like, I've never had this, like, that only happens in movies, you know, where like somebody wakes up from a dream and they look around and all of a sudden like, ah, oh, they're in a dream. And then like they wake up again and they're like, oh, that was fucked up. How do I know what is real? It was a very Nightmare on Elm Street type of plot twist. And um, as astounding as the effects were, I started to think, you know, all of the dreams these guys had were kind of the same. They sort of changed color schemes. Like, the first one was in a a rainy city. The second one was in a hotel. The third one was in this snowy fortress. But at all times, it was kind of modern Earth. And the the antagonists were kind of these machine gun-wielding dudes on on jeeps or trucks or vans and like that it was always the the nature of the threat was always very similar the setting was slightly different but also very similar in time scale and i know that was by design because the dreams that they're entering were designed by ellen page's character so it was done intentionally to keep the setting consistent and to keep them prepared so they didn't like nothing was thrown at them unexpectedly so I was like, I understand that, but at the same time, it seems like such wasted opportunity to throw dreamlike imagery into these dreams. And so they do a lot of the stuff where like there's strange weather patterns and the and the axis kind of shifts, like when when the real world is getting chaotic and they're they're like dreaming in the back of a van and things are speeding left and right. Like they kind of on the edge of perception feel that the world outside is shifting, like they dimly experience this thing. And I was like, that's good. That's very good what they're doing. I really like that kind of peripheral perception that's going on with these worlds where they they can pick up on what's going on in the outside world, but only very dimly, and they can't wake up. But at the same time, I was like, there's so many wasted opportunities for dreamlike imagery that they never pick up on. Like, you know, just, just, just as an example, nothing is nightmarish. And again, I know it's because Ellen Page is regulating these dreams and keeping it very consistent, but you never experience a nightmare, and you'd kind of like to wonder what it's like to experience a truly paralyzing nightmare or to see monsters. You know, the the, the fact that the threats only take the form of gunmen, seem it, it's effective, but it also seems a little unimaginative. And it, this would have really helped distinguish it from The Matrix if... 
for instance, the subconscious defenses of these guys took the form of something more drastic. Like, like the train was good, but if it took the form of giants or do like flying dudes or like uh, if the guy was really into sci-fi, like if like Star Wars stormtroopers came rushing down or. You know what I'm saying? Like trolls or guys with like long bows, guys who have specific roles. You you could have really gone off the wall here, and I'm not sure if it's good or not that they didn't do that. That they that Nolan kind of kept it restrained, but it would have helped, I think, the dreamy imagery if 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 really weird stuff happened, like like faceless dudes, like in Dark City or Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. You know, like in Eternal Sunshine when. People's memories are, are faded or distant or unimportant. That their faces are just kind of blank. And I thought, you know, that would have really been effective in terms of nightmarish imagery. If, like, if the subconscious forces that were attacking were, like, these blank-faced, completely faceless enforcers that came out of nowhere or were monstrous entities that, that came lurching out of the shadows to attack. I was like, that would have been really cool. And, you know... The dreamlike imagery has been pulled off to much better effect in Eternal Sunshine. Um, if you've ever seen David Lynch's Mulholland Drive, Inland Empire, uh, the fuck is the other one? Um, uh, Mulholland Drive, Inland Empire, the, the, the stuff like that, if you know what I'm saying. Um, where guys have really strange facial expressions or like really bug eyes or like the people are behaving in like really erratic fashions and are like, you know, kind of doing these really like, like moving in ways people would not move. Um, and there were, there were, there were moments of brilliance in that movie where they did act that way. Where when things happened, you were like, Oh shit, this, that was kind of scary. What's just happened? Like, um, when Cobb is talking to Fisher in this dream and, all of a sudden, he says something that alerts his subconscious. Like he says, "You you realize I'm I'm not real or something like that." And all of a sudden, everyone in the everyone in the restaurant who are projections of his subconscious, if you don't understand, um, the people in your dreams in this movie's logic are projections of your subconscious. And when you start to alert the subconscious that something is wrong, they turn hostile. You know. So, like, if they know you don't belong in this person's dream, they will try to throw you out. They become aggressive. So, he alerts this guy's subconscious, and everyone in the restaurant, in unison, like, turns their head. And it's kind of like, oh, yeah, Wisconsin. And so, they, it, they almost should have started playing that. Like, oh, yeah, Wisconsin. And so, but, like, everyone's like, Phew. Like that, and they turn, and like everyone scowls at him. And like he puts the guy's fears at rest, and they're like, Whew, and they go back to their business. I was like, that was kind of cool. You know, they should have really harped on that some more. Um, you know, the, changing the setting to where it's like maybe changing it to a far future setting. It, it, it might have actually helped their case. You know, like if they're trying to put the guy off guard, or do things he wouldn't normally do, or do things that are nonsensical things that wouldn't necessarily alert his subconscious that something is weird like if they maybe if they had projected his dream and made a dream that where he's like in star wars or some kind of far future type thing or or projected something in the renaissance italy something really weird or or harken back to a movie or a novel or something like that where he's having some kind of nightmare throwing him into like this this really grave nightmare where he's being chased by some killer or something like that something that might put him off his guard and reveal some secret in that way it would have been kind of cool if they'd explored it that way so, like really throwing him up against freddy krueger or something like that so pardon me that's all i was really saying with with that one is it does a lot with a dreamlike imagery but with a concept that interesting you kind of want the you you want the sun and sky you know you want it all you've got when when you open it up to the dream like the, the limitless realms of impossibility that the imagination can provide even with the heights this movie reaches you're kind of wanting more and so i think that's what holds it back from being great like i don't even know that's why i say this is a really remarkable film and yet immensely disappointing at the same time cuz I love this film, and I wanted so much more. I don't know if that even makes sense. Where I was like, you know, that I would I would definitely watch this film again. And yet, every time I watch this film, I'm going to be like, so, like, damn, they could have done so much more there. And, like, this movie would have cost a zillion dollars if they, if they had done everything I was thinking of. But, at the same time, it's really cool, because this is an inspiring film. 
You know what I mean? Like, if if you ever wanted to get inspiration on like what you could have done to make this movie better, or like a, a kind of movie like this where you're you're tapping into the science fiction creativity, I was like, that was really cool. So, where I turned on this movie again is that I read I, I started read I read I started reading some analysis online. You know, a lot of people are really eager to tear into this movie and tear it apart. So, undoubtedly, over the course of months you're going to see a lot of really off-the-wall analyses of this film that kind of deconstruct it and, and tell us, you know, kind of explanations of the ending, which I won't spoil here. Um, explanations of the movie in general, like, you know, what was a dream, what was not a dream, the significance of various characters. But here, this is a spoiler. Um, the, the analysis I read that was really interesting basically paints this movie as an allegory. And I think your enjoyment of this film will really boil down to how frustrated you get with allegory. Um, and on whether or not you really like it, or if you feel it's too forced, or if you think it's just a really bad way of telling a story. And actually, I kind of do. I, I think allegory tends to be kind of pretentious. But I read this analysis that when I stopped to think about it, I was like, you know what? This It, I, it really does fit. And the analysis was that Inception is really an allegory for filmmaking. And essentially that that filmmaking is the process of crafting dreams. And the more he started to deconstruct it, and you know, I, I really tip my hat to the guy who, who kind of figured this out and put it all down, and, and, and like, seriously, better movie critic than I. Um, so he started explaining, like, just like the movie process, it's kind of the process of crafting dreams. And so everyone in this movie had a parallel role to the filmmaking process. For instance, Cobb is kind of the director. He administrates everything that's going on. You know, he's the one in charge. Um, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, the guy who—he's kind of the go-to guy who gets things done. He does the research. He sets things up. He puts everything in motion. He's the producer. Uh, Ellen Page's character is the screenwriter because she creates this world that all the characters live in, and she kind of orchestrates the architecture and actions and sets the stage, literally. For everything that happens, um, the Saito uh, Ken Watanabe's character is the guy with the money. You know, he's the pro he's he's also kind of a producer, but he's the he's the he's the funds. You know, and he he really deconstructs how everyone had this kind of parallel role with a filmmaking process, and you know, he even said like in in the context of the dream, the dreamer themselves, like the projections of the subconscious, are kind of parallel to the audience. For instance. This may only make sense if you've actually seen the movie, but um, just like a movie audience, if you start telling a really crazy story, if you start throwing bizarre imagery or strange plot twists or things that could not possibly happen, impossible architecture, uh, really strange stuff, brazen special effects or really badly executed special effects, the audience notices, slowly begins to notice, and eventually will grow hostile against the filmmaker for for throwing things into a movie that don't fit. You know what I mean? So when you start when you start manipulating the audience too much with brazen effects and bad storytelling, the audience becomes aggressive. I was like, that's that's a kind of brilliant analysis. I kinda like that. Um, he also go. He also went into more effects like um, you know who could really be dreaming. Does it matter if they are dreaming? Um, is the is the satisfaction? Are the emotions uh, and satisfaction one gets out of overcoming an obstacle in a dream any less satisfying than obstacles that occur in real life? That sort of thing. And so I really got a new appreciation for that movie when I started to realize that yeah, it probably was really allegorical. Um, and yet it holds up as a film so well, at least as, as kind of an experience to see in the theater. Really liked it. And um, I don't know if they did this in 3D. I didn't see it in 3D. I hope they don't because, um, you know, if I had a complaint, this is a really long movie. And it uh, it is a test of your ability to concentrate because I'm even the kind of guy who is ready, willing, and able to focus on a movie 100% on a film and to really try to understand it, to grok it. And and but even even by the end when they started getting to the snow fortress, I started getting a little frustrated. I was like, 
do we really need to go four layers deep in the dream? Did we did we need to did we need to go this far? Because you're pushing it, you know. Like there's there's a lot of audience goodwill that goes on when you're when you're willing to accept these things that that happen, and then they start piling it on. And and like I said, maybe that was intentional. Like like if if everything is kind of a if everything is dreamlike and everything, I, I really started to question whether or not like anything was real in this film because so much stuff happens in the in the real world that Cobb exists in. Whether or not that was a dream, because so many things happen in that real world that are dreamlike. In fact, nightmarish. Like um, he really is being chased by like faceless corporate drones at all times who are like this boogeyman that keep coming out of the shadows for him. Uh, when he is being chased, he starts experiencing things that are very claustrophobic, um, nightmarish. Like uh, I, I, what tipped me off right away was he was running away from these goons, and he's starting to squeeze between these two buildings, and these buildings are like impossibly narrow, and he's trying to like squeeze through, and he's like he can't get out, he can't move, and I'm like that's classic nightmare imagery, like right there. Saito shows up out of nowhere in like Mombasa, and, and like and rescues him, and like what the fuck are you doing here? That only happens in dreams, you know. So there was actually a lot of plot convenience, a lot of really bizarre technology, strange things that happen with no explanation. And if you take it all as read that basically you're experiencing a dream right there, it almost makes sense in that regard because in a dream, weird stuff happens and you just kind of roll with it. You know, these, these bizarre set, the situations are set up and you don't question it at the time. You know, you just, you, you take this dream at face value and you just go with it. And so... In that regard, you can either see them as really brazen plot holes, or you can see them as intentional plot holes that reinforce the conceit that all of this is unreal. And yet, does it really matter that all of it is unreal? Because at, in this context, it is real, and it is occurring. And so, there were other things that I thought really were, were tip-offs that it, that it might not have been real especially since they make a great deal of focus on the fact that you need to have a totem like some like like one out one object that is your grounded reality like one thing that only you know what it is you know what it feels like and that when you see it and you hold it you know that it's yours so like joseph gordon levitt has his die and he'll only he knows what is what what number the die rolls on and like you know it's heaviness and yet Leonardo DiCaprio has this top, this metal top that he knows that if it's a dream and it keeps spinning, that he's still in a dream. But if it stops spinning, he's in reality. And yet, um, Joseph Gordon-Levitt makes this big uh, thing about saying, like, you can't touch this dice. Like, nobody can hold this die but me because it would defeat the purpose. Then, then someone else would know what it is and I could be in your dream and whatever. So Cobb's got this top, but it's not his top, is it? It's his wife's top. It's hers. So, like, he's basically holding her totem. It's not his. You know, it's not his one thing. He didn't make it. He didn't turn that into his grounded reality. You know what I'm saying? So, like, like even the top cannot be trusted. Nothing can be trusted. So, I, I, I think just being able to turn this movie over in your head is, is worth the price of admission alone. Whether or not you come away from it liking it or not... You might think this is a vastly overrated, full of plot holes piece of shit. And I maybe wouldn't even be able to argue with you that much. Because it's up to you, in the end, whether or not you think it is an allegory, whether or not you appreciate the fact that it is an allegory, whether or not that frustrates you, whether or not you think this is an overwrought story that, that doesn't really, like, in the end, does anything really get accomplished? And whether it does or not, did it really matter? I don't know. But I think it's cool. It's it's kind of cool and maybe intentional that it raises those questions. So hey, bravo to Christopher Nolan. You know he 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 put this really strange, really cool movie out there. Made me think about it. Maybe turn it over and do research on this fucking thing online. See what other people thought about it. And I think, you know, in terms of an artistic venture, it's a great success because it got me talking about it. Got me looking into it. It inspired me creatively. I'd go see it again. So, hey, like, like I said, you know, this is the kind of movie I, I could turn over endlessly in my head, and I, I can, like I said, I, I, I've done complete reversals on this, liking it, not liking it, thinking it was a little overrated, then really appreciating the artistry of it. I, I, that's, I can safely say that's a rare experience for me. So, I would check out Inception. Uh, seriously, like, just 
experience it for yourself. Um, only you know whether or not you're going to like this movie. And I didn't know whether or not I was going to like this movie. So I, I think this was, <clears throat> as a way of spending an evening, as a way of uh, experiencing a really interesting film, could hardly go wrong with this one. So check out Inception. I, I really don't think you'll regret it, whether you like the movie or not. <laughs>